Hello, everybody. This is John Fenn, and this is part three out of a four-part series talking about emotional healing. It's the ways the Lord sets us on a journey towards emotional health. And I started asking the question, if we see so many people healed in the Gospels by Jesus simply laying hands on them and healing them, like the leper, like the blind man, like the cripple, like the deaf person, why, if he carries our sorrows and our griefs, does he not have a record in the Gospels of laying hands on somebody and saying, be healed of the trauma you uh, were subjected to when you were a child. Be healed of the, of the burden you carry, the grief that you carry, the bitterness that you carry from when you were a child. Why is it we don't see a record of Jesus laying hands on a person and instantly healing them emotionally? We do physically, instant healings physically, but not emotionally. And in this series, we've been going over the, the reason why, and it goes back to our foundational scripture in Isaiah chapter 42, verses three and four, where it says that the Lord will not, will not do further damage to a bruised stem, and he will not extinguish a barely lit lamp, but he will instead bring truth into light. And that truth is so important to understand. The truth that he's talking about is the truth as he sees it. You see, we live our lives and we think we have a certain truth. We have a history. And we say, well, this is, of course, what happened to me. We looked at the woman at the well who had had five husbands and now she's living with a sixth. And she had this life history of, of, of all, you know, what had happened to her. And Jesus comes in, she says in John 4, 39, she says, Jesus told me everything I ever did which means she had to reset her history. She had to rethink the way that she had been raised. She had to rethink her past because she had had those five husbands and she was thinking, you know, this was me. This was all by myself. I'm a survivor. I will overcome. But in reality, she learned that Jesus was there the whole time, that he was walking with her through each one of those. And that changed her perspective on her past. And we also saw that the Lord has, has acknowledged, he always acknowledges where the person is without condemnation. He just stated, you've had five husbands, the man you're now living with is not your, your husband. To the woman caught in adultery, he said, neither do I condemn you. There was no opinion to it, there was no condemnation, there was no guilt, there was nothing on there at all. And so you and I have to realize that as well. We have to be allowed to reset. We have to purposely think about our past differently, that now the Lord is in my life. He really was there the whole time, and now he's gonna set us on a path, on a, a, on a new path. And you really remember, Jesus said the spirit of truth. In John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said, actually in verse 12, he said, I have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them right now. You can't grasp them right now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And that element right there, that he is the spirit of truth, means that he will take our history and what we thought our history was and how we thought we were all alone and how damaged we thought we were and he will put the, his truth into it to acknowledge that he was there all along and he has come for healing. He's not gonna answer every question about why you went through what you went through. He's not gonna be able to answer all of that this side of heaven. But what he will do is acknowledge where you are, uh, acknowledge what you've been through, and then set you on the path towards healing. And that's what we wanna look at. He does that by bringing truth to light. And bringing truth to light means we have to now look at life through his eyes through his perspective and not our own damaged perspective. And so we wanna look at a man now in Mark chapter five who had 2,000 demons in him. He's, he's a man that we know of uh, as being delivered from the demon called Legion. And I say 2,000 because in Jesus' time to a legion, a Roman legion was 2,000 soldiers. And so there's a man who has a demon and the lead demon, the captain of the demon, so to speak, was named Legion. And Jesus cast Legion and all the other demons out of the man. Now, up until that point, we don't know how he got in that condition, but they tried to bind him with chains, but he would cut himself, he would go through the graves. He was, he was crazy and, and no chain could hold him and he'd cut himself and, and cause pain to himself, and, but there wasn't anything anybody could do. But Jesus cast the demons out of the man. And we pick this up in Mark chapter five. And it said in uh, verse 15 that he, they saw the man who had had the legion cast out of him clothed in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. He was clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid because of the dramatic change in his life. Now understand this man 
uh, is a Greek man. This area where Jesus had, had, had come over on the boat was an area where there was a lot of Greek population, not just Jewish, but a lot of Greek population. This man was a Greek man. And it says in the text here in Mark chapter 5 that um, verse 18 says that he begged Jesus to let him follow him. So you've got to understand this man goes from being crazy, being demon-possessed, to being clothed and healed in his right mind, and he's begging Jesus, please let me come with you, please let me follow you. But of course, he was a Greek man, and Jesus was there first of all at that time, especially to minister to Israel first. So it would not go over well for him to have one of his disciples being Greek. So Jesus said, no, you stay here, and he gave him instructions. He said, go home to your friends, Tell them how the Lord has had compassion on you and what great things he has done. Notice how Jesus redirected him. You see, we, we go through life and we think our life will be a certain way. We think, you know, we imagine things. We think this is how I want my life to be. And then life happens and, and different things happen and, we, and it doesn't go as we planned. And we then become upset. We can become depressed. We can be hurt through all the things that happen. And we think, okay, I'm gonna follow Jesus now. And we don't know exactly what that means, but to this man, I want you to look at his emotions after he's been delivered so miraculously and all he wants to do is follow Jesus and Jesus says no. In fact, Jesus directs him to go back to his family and his friends, go home to your friends and tell what great things the Lord has done for you and what great compassion the Lord has had on you. It's interesting that Jesus is helping this man rebuild his emotional life. He had been a crazy man. He'd re, he's got to rebuild his whole mind, his whole thought processes because of the, the possession of the demons that he'd been in. And we don't know exactly what got him in that condition, but the, the hints are that it was an unclean spirit, which um, in, in the Bible terms, an unclean spirit can refer to any demonic spirit, but the term unclean spirit can also refer to sexually unclean, uh, perversion in that, and the fact that he was bound with chains and that he cut himself and tells us that he may have been involved in some um, perverted practices that opened himself up to the demons that eventually 2,000 of them possessed him and caused him to be naked uh, with chains and cutting himself and everything in the tombs. So now we find him, he's clothed, he's seated at the feet of Jesus, he just wants nothing more than to follow Jesus. And Jesus tells him no. And he says, go back. This is the new direction. He says, go back and t to your home and tell your friends what great things the Lord has done and how he had compassion on you. It's both, it's both the power of the Lord and it is the compassion of the Lord. And it's similar to the woman at the well and the woman that we saw caught in adultery. Uh, and even, if you will, the, the man that we saw in the previous uh, segments uh, who's had the withered arm healed. Each of them has to go back and create their new life in him. It was not a matter of, of just picking them up and putting them in a new location and saying, okay, brand new, start all over. In each case, like the woman at the well, she lived in that town where she was living with that sixth man, and that forced her. Is she going to continue living with him? Is she going to divorce him? Is she going to marry him? The woman who was caught in adultery, and Jesus said, go and sin no more. She had to go back into that community. She had to, she had to um, you know, break it off with the man that she'd been involved with. She had to live upright life. She had to restore her reputation by, by living rightly. And she had to rebuild her life. And see, this is the way the Lord heals us emotionally. He begins a process. And that's one of the things that I want you to see. It is a journey. It is a process that we have to go through to rebuild our lives. And we do that, and this is the key, by making a series of small decisions. Correct small decisions. Seemingly insignificant. When Jesus told this man who had legion to go back, and he says, go home to your friends Tell them the, uh, the, the power of the Lord, what he's done for you, and tell them the compassion of the Lord. There were the four elements right there. It says in, uh, in Mark chapter 5 and verse 20 that he went through all that region through the Decapolis. Now, Decapolis was an area of 10 Greek cities. Uh, the, if you look at that Greek word, deca is, is the word for 10 in Greek. And so there were 10 Greek cities that we know about. Historically, we know that to be a fact. 
10 Greek cities. And this man went throughout all the cities, all the cities, telling everybody what the Lord had done for him. And that was acknowledging where he'd been and acknowledging what the Lord had done. And it was all bound by the compassion of the Lord. So this is the process for us as well. Just like the woman at the well, just like the man with the withered arm had to rebuild his life and go get a job, perhaps get his family back, his livelihood back, perhaps own his own home now instead of being a beggar perhaps because he'd had a withered arm and unable to work. I mean, we're just putting ourselves in these people's situation. And now this man who's now clothed in his right mind, having been totally delivered from all these demons, and Jesus says, go back to your family, go back to your friends, tell them the power of the Lord. Now put yourself in his position. This man had just been delivered of 2,000 demons, and Jesus says, now go back into the same culture, the same environment, the same town where you came out of. Go home and tell your friends. His friends were the ones who got him into that trouble. His friends were the one, the fact that he still had friends, the fact that, that the Lord could say, go tell your friends, go home and tell your friends, tells you that these were the guys who were opening himself up, who got involved in all this stuff in the first place. And he says, tell them the power of the Lord and tell them the compassion of the Lord in your life. And so part of the journey of taking responsibility, I mentioned at the end of the last segment about taking responsibility for our lives, is that responsibility to be vocal, to be forward, to recount what the Lord has done for us. Imagine he went through 10 cities telling everybody what the Lord had done. He went to his family, he went to his friends. And what this tells us is this, that this process is gradual because every time you tell your testimony, Every time you tell what the Lord has done for you, every time you, you recount in your own life the compassion of the Lord and what he did for you, it brings healing to your past memories. It brings healing to what you went through. Imagine this man, he's going back into the same town and he passes a familiar house. And maybe he remembers that house and he says, wow, that's the house that I first got hooked on to drugs. This is the house where I first learned of, of sexual perversion. Wow, look at that house there. And what happens is this, the memories of all these things would come flooding up into his mind. The memory of all this would come up to his mind and he would have to confront that memory with the new reality. Because remember, Jesus establishes a new context. He lets us know he was there during the trauma. He was aware of what we were, we were going through. And so as this man passes, I'm, I'm speculating here, but let's say it happens to us. We, you see, we see this in real life. So it's not too far of a jump to speculate that this is what was going on because we see this daily with people, that they go back to their friends, they go back to their family, they go back to the very areas that got them into sin and now they have to tell people about the Lord and they are bubbling over with the miracle that God has done for them. And, and so Jesus tells this man to do the same thing. He, sa he says, when you go back and tell your friends what great power the Lord has done for you, what he's done for you, and the compassion he's had on you. So this man would go back and he'd, he'd pass that house. Wow, that's the party house on the block. I remember so many things that happened there. So many, so that's where I first started getting hooked on drugs. That's where I first started getting into all this stuff. And he would have to then look back and he'd have to go buy it and he'd have to recount. He'd have to, to counter those thoughts and those memories with new thoughts and new ways of thinking. That's how he takes us on the journey. See, oftentimes, again, like I said in an earlier segment, that we think that the memories of the past come up and that's the devil tormenting us with those memories. But many, many times, when he's, in fact, when he starts us down this path of healing, it is the Lord bringing these things up so that we can deal with them, so that we can think new thoughts, so that we can react to them according to the new history, the new context that Jesus put, a, put us in and, and stated to us. Like the woman at the well who thought she was all alone with those five husbands before and then she said in verse 39 there in, in uh, John 4, 30, uh, 39, he told me everything I ever did. It was an amazing revelation to her that Jesus was there knowing everything that she went through. And so that helped reset the way she looked at her past. And the same thing with Legion, with the man who had Legion cast out of him. He had to sit there and he had to, he had to tell people and it, he, he thought differently about his past because of the power of the Lord in his life. That's what we have to do. For instance, Many people are familiar with the scripture in Isaiah chapter 55. Um, it was very popular uh, some years ago, and it has been used by pastors, I might say incorrectly, in Isaiah 55, in verses 7 uh, through uh, 8, 7 and 8 and 9. In Isaiah 55, verses 7, 8 and 9, the Lord says this, Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts for my ways are higher and my thoughts are higher. Now, many people have used that when you say, let the wicked forsake his ways and his thoughts and, and come to my ways, they're higher. 
because they're higher. Many have used this to say, oh, God's ways are so high. God's thoughts are so high, I can never attain to them. God is God. He works in mysterious ways. And many preachers have used it to, to that verse to totally misconstrue what God is saying, to, to get to misunderstanding of what God is saying. When, when, he says in verse, when he says in verse 7, let the wicked forsake his ways and thoughts, to forsake something means to leave it. So he's saying, let the wicked person leave their ways and thoughts. And he says, let him return to the Lord and come up for my ways and my thoughts are higher. So this is not God saying, hey, my ways are much higher than yours. My thoughts are much higher. He's saying, forsake your old ways and come up to my new ways. He's not saying they're so high and lofty that you cannot attain to them. He is saying, forsake your old ways, come to my ways, walk in the new ways, walk in the new, in the new thoughts. And that is the process that we're talking about, to forsake our old ways and thoughts and come up to the Lord's higher ways and thoughts. And, and this is the process that we're talking about. But it takes mental strength. It takes mental discipline to do that. It takes a desire within you to be free. If you think that you've been waiting around and you've just been waiting for God to, to zap you on the head and take away your memories, he's not going to do that. There, there's not a record of the Lord doing that in the Scripture. Will he meet you where you are? Absolutely. He met the woman at the well exactly where she was. He met the woman caught in adultery exactly where she was. Just stated exactly where they were with no editorial with no condemnation, with nothing like that. But if you think he's just going to pick you up and zap you and change your mind, you're wrong. He's going to help you walk your way through it. In Romans chapter 1 and verse, or excuse me, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, let us undergo a renewal, is one word for it, through the renewing of our mind. The, the word uh, renewal is metamorphosis in the Greek. It is the process through which a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Paul says a person can undergo a metamorphosis by renewing the mind, by thinking these new thoughts, these high thoughts. So what are we talking about? Some of the ways that we, we look at ourselves. Well, what are these higher thoughts versus lower thoughts? Some of the lower thoughts may be like this man Legion may have had or the woman at the well may have had or even the man with the withered arm may have had, which is that they don't love themselves. They don't even like themselves. What did they do to deserve this? Why is God against me? Why do I have this curse upon me? You know, why is God the bad guy? You know, what does he have against me? What did I ever do against God? Um, you know, I don't like myself. I, I hate other people. Whatever the case is, those are the old ways and the old thoughts. And the Lord says, leave those ways and thoughts and come up to my ways and thoughts. They're higher. That's what he's doing with each one of these people that we've been talking about. And so you have to rethink how you view people. You have to get in touch with the Lord and you have to allow him to touch and reset the context of your, of your experience. And you can say, okay, I can forgive them. I will make the decision to forgive. It'll be a hard one. I, it's a higher way and a higher thought. And it would be, I'm making myself miserable while I'm holding on to resentment and bitterness, but I will forgive that person. And you make that decision. That's a higher way and higher thought. But when you are there, see, Jesus, again, in John 16, 13, said the spirit of truth is there to guide you into truth. He only operates in truth. He's not going to stay there and wallow, wallow in the dirt with you. He's not going to ro you know, roll around in the dirt of your past with you. He is the spirit of truth, and he will seek to cause you to, to think higher ways and higher thoughts, like forgiveness, like love, like gentleness, like meekness, like patience, like kindness, those higher ways and those higher thoughts, and he will help you take that next step. And that's what that man who'd had de the demons cast out of him had to do. He, he had to, um, to go back into his home, back into his friends, the very people who got him messed up to begin with, and he had to go back to them and he had to forgive them, and he had to confront them. He had to think about all the things that he'd been through, naked, cutting himself, in the tombs, crazy with, because he'd been possessed of demons, and he's got to go back, according to Jesus' instructions in Mark chapter 5 and verse 19, go back to your home and your friends and tell them the power of the Lord and what, the compassion, what compassion he had for you. Jesus is sending him right back into the people that he knew, the people who had messed him up to begin with, and he has to now deal with them according to higher ways and higher thoughts. He has to forgive them. He has to tell them of the Lord and, and the changes that have gone on in his life. As he does that, those memories are healed. With every time he tells his testimony, with every time he talks about the power of God, the memories of his past, the, the ability to forgive himself, if you will, 
to, to remove his own guilt and condemnation that he placed on himself. With every telling of the Lord's power and the Lord's compassion on him, he, he, he heals that a little bit more. The Lord comes in with his truth, and it's like a, like a healing balm, like a healing lotion that is put on that old wound. And bit by bit, the memory will remain, but the pain will be gone. And that's what this man did. This is how he got delivered. This is how he got set on the road to healing. I want to look at another one. I've got, I'm going to start this. It's in the same chapter, Mark chapter 5. This is the woman who had a, a severe medical condition, a, um, a hemorrhaging, what we would call today a hemorrhaging condition, a blood condition, in which um, medically speaking she was bleeding all month long. And she had only grown weak, and she spent all her money, it says, in Mark chapter 5. And... Uh, verse uh, 26 and 27 and 28, it says that she spent 12 years, spent all her money, and she was only worse by the doctors. And you can only imagine with a woman with such a very personal condition, a very private condition, and she spent all her money, she was only getting worse. You can only imagine the barbaric, in our terms, the barbaric medical practices that were around there in the first century to try to cure this woman to where her her monthly life uh, wasn't just bleeding constantly. Medically, she probably was very anemic. She was probably very, felt very fatigued and very weak. And it says in Mark chapter 5 and verse 26, uh, excuse me, verse 27, she said, when she heard of Jesus, she said, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Now, I want you to think, a, a, a Jewish woman in this context, a Jewish woman who was bleeding all month long was ceremonial unclean. She could not approach the temple. She could not make a sacrifice to God. She uh, was unclean, like similar to what a leper was, not quite to the same degree, but, but pretty much uh, untouchable. Uh, there were no, re assuming she was married, there were no relationship between she and her husband. That was forbidden in that time frame. Um, all the different things that happened, she may have lost her family, but... It says when she heard about Jesus. Now understand, she's got 12 years of a particular history. She was evidently, you know, normal, healthy at some point, but for 12 years she'd been, been tormented by this condition, uh, medical condition within her, uh, in which there was no human cur uh, uh, cure at that time. And so she's got this history, and that's the truth to her. That is the truth to her. And she's, she's no doubt weak and anemic, and she hears of Jesus. What does that mean, she heard of Jesus? Well, when she heard of Jesus, she was hearing about the miracles that he did. She was hearing about the blind eyes being opened. She was hearing about the deaf hearing. Uh, she was hearing about the lame being healed. And she said within herself in Mark chapter 5 and verse 27, when she heard of Jesus, she said within herself, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. See, she was unclean, so she could not legally touch a man. You know, because of this bleeding condition, she could not legally touch a man. And so, and so she just wanted to touch just the fringe of his garment. That's all that's required. Now, of course, when she does that, Jesus re immediately recognizes in verse 30 that power has gone out from him. And in Mark chapter 5, verse 30, he says, who touched my clothes? Of course, Peter and everybody says, Lord, look at the crowd. Everybody's touching you, jostling you, running back and forth, trying to touch you and grab you and everything else. He says, no, 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 I felt power go out of me. So who touched me? And this woman, it says here, it, Jesus, it says in verse 32 that Jesus looked round about at everybody. I mean, can you imagine they're walking through the street, everyone's jostling Jesus, and suddenly he comes to, to a stop, and he starts looking around who touched me. He's looking around for whoever it was that drew the power out of him. And it says in verse 33 that the woman was fearing and trembling and came down before him and, and worshiped him and admitted that she was the one. Fearing and trembling. I mean, she was so much afraid she was shaking. Imagine, again, this is a very private condition. You don't advertise this type of condition, you know, now or then. It's, it's so very private. And now she gets healed, and Jesus said, okay, who is it? You know, and how kind of the Lord that he did not talk about her condition. He did not uh, make it public knowledge between he and they and the immediate um, circle of disciples. They were the ones who knew because they were close to that conversation. But Jesus didn't publish, hey, everybody, hey, we've got a woman here with this condition. He didn't do that. He's not going to embarrass a person. But he says, your faith has made you whole. Now, I want you to think, what's he doing? What kind of a, a path of emotional healing is he bringing to her? 
Well, physically, when she was healed, certainly there are emotional healings that go with that. No longer is she ceremonially unclean. She can go back to her husband. She can go back to her family. She can go up to the temple now and, and worship. She can restore her life. And time after time after time, what we see is when the Lord presents the truth of his life and his perspective to a person, he asks them to build their life anew. The woman at the well, what are you gonna do with this guy you're living with? The woman caught in adultery when Jesus said, go and sin no more, breaking it off, starting a new life, starting a new pattern, a new lifestyle, a new habit, set of habits. Uh, the man with the withered arm going back to work. The man who had uh, been, had legion and been cast out, he had to go back to his family and his friends and, and tell them about the power of the Lord. It's, it's charting a course to a new life. And this is the great hope for us as we're studying this. This is segment number three out of four segments on this. And we look at this and we say, wow, this is a new life. He's charting a course for a new life. And you have to believe, you have to have the same hope of this woman. When she heard about Jesus, she said, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. There was hope that sprang up in her. And that's what happens with us. He acknowledges, he acknowledges where we are. He sets us free, and then he sets us forth on a, on a new journey. But we have to be willing to acknowledge his truth, to allow the spirit of truth to come in and, and bring us up into higher ways, ways like forgiveness and love and joy and peace and long-suffering and honesty and godliness and consistency in our lives. And nobody's perfect. You're not going to be perfect. That's why it's a journey. That's why it's, it's, it's a lifelong process. That's why, again, Romans 12, 2 says it is a metamorphosis that goes on. That caterpillar that goes into that cocoon does not turn into a butterfly overnight, and neither will you. But it is a process. It's important that you put one foot in front of the other. So I'm going to pray real quick before we begin segment number four and talk about this a little bit more about how do we actually capture thoughts that are not right and replace them with good thoughts. So in the name of Jesus, Father, I ask right now for everybody listening that you touch them where they are, that you give them wisdom and revelation, that you show them by revelation, Father, where they are and show them the future. Guide them into all truth. Show them things to come, Heavenly Father. Show them what their new life can be, just like you showed the new life of the man who'd had demon cast out and, and the woman uh, here with the, the issue of blood that had been healed and the, the vision, the imagination, the, the possibilities of the new life as they walk into the higher ways. Cause that excitement to grow within them right now, Father God. I thank you for doing that. Thank you for renewing new lives, Father God, and charting new paths for us. And I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Hi everybody, this is John Fan here once again at TV7, and I encourage you to partner with us, to be a part of the ministry, part of the fellowship of bringing this tremendous programming to Christians and the unsaved alike. You know, Paul had a time in his ministry where he was talking about, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, they were so eager to join with him in the ministry because they recognized they were partners in what he was doing. And an angel told the Roman centurion Cornelius in Acts 10.3 that his, his offerings had come up as a memorial before God. I'm telling you, when your, your gifts and your donations leave your hands, it doesn't stay here on the earth. In some way, God recognizes that and calls that to be a memorial before him. What an exciting thing to do, to be able to live our lives and to affect untold thousands of people by your giving. So I ask that you would join with us right now. The information is on your screen. It is so worthy, and I'm telling you, it's got an eternal weight, an eternal benefit to join with us in the ministry and the fellowship to the saints. God bless you for doing that. Thank you.